Hi friends, thank you for listening to our podcast. I trust that the word of God that's been preached has been a great blessing to you. It is our desire to continue to preach the word of God relevantly and uncompromisingly. And if you would like to be a part of what God is doing through us, I would like to encourage you to sow generously into our ministry so that you can give us the tools and uh, the ability to continue to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Thank you for sowing generously. May God bless you and may God continue to use what He has put into your hands. Thank you. Fantastic. Come on, let's give the team a big hand. One more time, turn to your neighbor and say, Gong Si Fa Chai. You looking forward to Chinese New Year? When I, I go to all the malls and all the songs are Tong Tong Chiang, then I go home, my daughter is playing Chinese New Year song, come to church, also Chinese New Year song, there's no escape of Chinese New Year. Everywhere you go, that's the mood. How many of you remember your nickname when you were younger? How many of you are boy, are girl here? A boy? You're, you're, you go home, even though you are 40 years old, they still call you a boy? Uh, I have a few. How many of you turn to your neighbor and share with them your nickname when you are younger? How many of you are, you know, Salmankai or I don't know? Are you guys okay? You, I, I'm feeling everyone is a little bit tense, a little bit can't wait to be home. I know you want to travel back already, but we are here today for the Word of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be good. Help me preach today. Is that alright? You know, uh, Chinese New Year, it's a, a very strange thing because one of the things that you experience is aunties, usually aunties or sometimes uncle will ask you questions. So when you are a student, they will ask you, hey, how are your study okay or not? How many A's you got? What's your GPA? What's your CGPA? Uh, uh, where you study? If you have graduated, they will ask you, hey, when are you going to get a girlfriend? If you have a girlfriend, they will ask you when you're going to get married. When you're married, they will ask you when you're going to have a child, a baby. When you have one child, they're going to ask you when you're going to have a second one. When you have a second one, they're going to ask you when you have a third one. When you have a third one, they're going to ask you when you're going to have a Fourth one, it, it, it doesn't finish. I, I remember one of the one of those comments that I usually get is that, hey Keith, your kids are all so cute. Why not you have a few more? Yeah, right. Like who is paying? You know, this is not buying eggs from the supermarket. You know, this is not just it cost. Of course, I'm happy to be a, a father of the three, but consistently, you know, if you have a boy, they want ask you when you're going to get a girl is as if I am the one that determined life and death. I don't know. You know, I know you have signs to it, but uh, let's not go there. You said, okay? But people like to ask questions. Don't get offended. Just answer with a smile and say, huh, let me see how first. Don't, don't, don't get agitated. I know some of you, you dread to go home because of all these questions, but it is a good time for us to love our family members and to get together and have a happy reunion. Can I have an amen? When, 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 when you were younger, really one of the most common thing they will comment about you is, eh, hey, you're taller. It's, it's of course you're taller. If you stop growing taller, then eh, hey, you're like fat already. Huh? Uh, this is something that we shouldn't say. Is that okay? Wow. Like a lot of results coming back last year and this year very different. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, hey, you are much slimmer this year. Come on. You, you can tell them, I might not necessarily mean what I say, but the, the, the fella in front asked me to say one. Ah, just kidding. Are you ready for the word of God? It's going to be a good time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to verse 10 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We, have all, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you. We are grateful 
and we are happy, O oh Lord, to be found in your house under your word or your presence. I pray today you truly challenge us. Help us to see your word in our lives. Help us to understand, but most importantly, give us the strength to apply all that you have for us this year. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Everyone say, Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say it one more time. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to talk to you about developing resilience. Show me some enthusiasm. Developing resilience. Paul, one of the greatest, greatest servant of God that has ever lived on earth, said that he has been persecuted greatly. He has gone through a lot of hardship. But there was a reason that he kept bouncing back. It's because he knows what he is doing, why he is doing it. The great Apostle Paul, whose scholars believe that has written half of the New Testament, some said 13, some said 14 books out of the 27. But without arguing that he is probably one that has contributed the most to the New Testament church, especially preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. In Acts chapter 9, recorded the, the amazing story of Paul, or, or was called Saul in the beginning, on his way to Damascus, persecuting churches. You know, he, he, he was the one that consented to the stoning of Stephen, another disciple. He, he was the one that's fervently persecuting and closing down churches from cities to cities, encountered the Lord in the dramatical miraculous way on his way to Damascus upon that he was struck blind he was prayed by Ananias he was healed and there he began his ministry in Damascus he was fervent he was on fire he went on to Damascus to Antioch to Cyprus to Pisidia to Iconium to Lystra to Derby and to all the surrounding region fervently preaching the gospel of God and then in Lystra while everything is going on he saw a man crippled from birth at the corner of his eyes, immediately he looked at the man into his eyes and said, Now, stand up and walk. The man that was crippled from birth stood up that day and began to walk. The crowd immediately thought that this is no normal human being. He must be one of the gods of the Greeks to come down on earth to dwell among us. Immediately, all the people, the multitudes began to bring offerings and sacrifices saying that Paul and Barnabas are not human but they are gods they begin to worship them and Paul took the opportunity to explain to them and say no 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 I'm not God no 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 I'm, I'm you, you must know the one that give me the real power the the, the, the the one that created heaven and earth but it could not stop the crowd from bringing sacrifices to them they worship Paul and Barnabas that day and then in Acts chapter 14, verse 18 to verse 22. Are you guys all right? He says here, even with these words, even with their persuasion, even with them trying to stop the multitudes from coming near to worship them, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and warned the crowd over. They stoned Peter, they stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead but after the disciples had gathered around him he got up and went back into the city the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby if you are following you can see a very dramatic change in just a moment they were worshipped yes in just a split moment they were being stoned dragged and left for dead how could this happen? Is this something very familiar that reminded us that there was an occasion where they bowed down and laid palm leaves to welcome Jesus, the coming Messiah, and the very next few days, they crucified Him. You see, human opinions swayed all the time. Hello, are you all with me? If your ministry is dependent on what people say about you and how people treat you, very soon, you will give up. Good morning. Are you all with me? That, that you see, that, that, how, how can it be so drastic that kid, at one moment, they were worshipping them like gods. At the other moment, so quickly, they stoned him, dragged him, persecuted him, 
and left him outside of the city to just die. But though Paul was being badly stoned, dragged, dumped, and left outside, an amazing thing happened. He got up and went back into the city. He got up. Turn to your neighbor and say, he got up. You see, sometimes we are struck down. But the ability for you to get up is what determines your success in life. One of the common verses that we all, always hear is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Rejoice always, pray continually without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Bible says what? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. In every circumstances, learn to give thanks. So we have come to church many times hearing the importance of being joyful. For the joy of the Lord is our... Come on, talk to me. The joy of the Lord is our... This year we want to be stronger. So the joy of the Lord in your ministry, in your family, in your career, you ought to have the joy of the Lord. You ought to have. You hear a lot of times people preaching to you. Yes, we need to rejoice. Yes, we need to pray. How many of you believe that we need to pray? Yes, we need to pray more. We need to give thanks because giving thanks is the hallmark of Christianity that you are actually grateful for what God has already done for you. So giving thanks gives you a perspective of life in a different manner. Yes, we need to rejoice. Yes, we need to pray. Yes, we need to give thanks. But the key words that I want to highlight to you this morning is the word always. It's the word continually. It's the word in all circumstances. Not to give thanks once, but to give thanks in all circumstances. That is the real challenge of Christianity, isn't it? It is not to get it right one time, but it is your ability to get it right again and again and again that will define your walk and your success in God. Can I have an amen? Oh, come on, help me preach. Can I have an amen? We all know that we need to do the right things. We all have the concept of doing the right things. But it is being resilient. It is, it is the always, it is the continuously, it is the in all circumstances that will truly help your 2017 to be one that is successful. Can we give God a big hand? Hallelujah. Come on. Oh, come on, if you want to clap, give God a big hand. Hallelujah. Success is not a destination. Success is a journey. Success is not just reaching somewhere, but it is the direction, the, the process of us getting there. It is not an event. It is the quality of your being at the end of the day. Success is not just the results. If you are someone that is constantly striving to achieve and achieve and achieve, and you think that defines you, no, it is your ability to carry yourself as a way of life while you are achieving. So in order for us to be stronger, I believe one of the core qualities in life we need to possess is resilience. I strongly believe that if you want to make it count this year, you don't want it to be just another year. You need to be resilient. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to be resilient. Resilient. The word itself describes the ability to spring back after being bent or stretched out of shape. Resilient people will be able to weather any kind of weather, any kind of storms. They might get hit once, but they will get up again. Maybe even stronger than before. To be resilient means to have, to be a person with the ability to bounce back from defeats, discouragements, and hardship. It is to have the never say die attitude in your life. They are filled, you know, that these people are filled with a determination, inner determination, that whatever that they are going through will not last forever. A degree of mental robustness, delayed gratification, self-control, patience are all determining factors to your year, to your success. This is what I say always, continually, in all circumstances, without ceasing, we need to do the right thing. It is not about getting right once, it is striving to get it right all the time. Resilient people will ultimately be successful. And I want to see City Harvest, we are a resilient bunch. Can I have an amen? 
we are not a, a, a church that come one day, it is drizzling and we decided to not come to church. We are not resilient. You know, coming to church is not for your own consumption. Coming to church is to encourage one another. Hello, are you all with me? That if you still think today you come to church for yourself, then you must change. Because coming to church is not just for yourself, it's for the body of Christ. It is how we shine for Jesus Christ. Resilient people, I've mentioned, they bend, but they don't break. Resilience to me really means you bend, but you are not broken. Maybe you are tired of fighting the whole 2016. Maybe you are tired of your, your, the, the bullies in your company, the constant murmuring and complaining in your department. Maybe there is a big bully in your school that you dread to go. Maybe people have been gossiping behind you from wherever you come from. Maybe you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I don't know. Maybe you face temptation that you thought you have overcome, but it comes back to haunt you again. You, you, you thought that, hey, I have already overcame that last year. By, why why do, am I still struggling with this thought? Maybe you face some fears that, that, that just constantly come into your life. Maybe you face some failures or some mistakes that you have done and the consequences, and you are still living in that consequences. Maybe you are still being haunted by certain past experiences or past relationships. I want to tell you the key to breakthrough is not to run away, not to change environment, not to, not to go anywhere else, but to face it and be resilient about it. This is how God wants us to go through it. The reality is that there can be no victory without getting ourselves involved in some battles. There is, there is no, yes, I've, 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 I've done it, I've overcome it without involving yourself into battles. You know, I often tell myself that I cannot run away from battles, but I must learn to choose my fight correctly. I see the people recorded in the Bible, they chose their fights correctly. There are some things worth fighting for. There are many other things that are not worth fighting for. Not all battles are worth fighting for. Is that true? Learn to pick the right fight. Turn to your neighbor and say, pick the right fight. Don't pick a fight with your neighbor now. Is that okay? It's not the right thing to do. Just in case, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband and wife, you are sitting together with each other and you just fight this morning, you fought this morning, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm, I'm I don't want to fight with you. Is that okay? Okay, nobody will do that, I know. It's too obvious. But being resilient. Firstly, how do we develop resilience? Firstly, have a sense of mission. Have a sense of mission. You know, I, I want to share something with you. Before I decided on this title, I was actually contemplating between two titles. Developing resilience or robust faith. We need to be robust. We need to be able to go through tough times in life as a Christian. Our, our faith, church, our faith is birthed from great persecution. Our faith, Christian faith, if you look into the book of Acts or even in the lives of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is birthed off from a lot of sufferings. A sense of mission, it's very, very important if you want to develop resilience. You need to see what is the value or what is your worth in pursuing the things that you're pursuing? If your life goal goes along this line and say, oh, I just want a house, I just want a car, I just want a puppy and a few children, I will be really happy. I want you to think again. Yes, that is what you want, but that is not what God wants. God wants you to be a blessing. You know, the reason for you to be rich, to be prosperous, to be successful, it's always for the glory of God. Can I have an amen? I see people giving up easily. And if you want to understand the context of it, it is not because these people are not strong. It is not because these people are not talented. Sometimes it is not even because of resources. It is because they don't see a point of continuing. To say that the 
young generation is a generation that is, that is weaker, that gives up easily, it's wrong. They just couldn't find the purpose for being resilient. Having a sense of mission keeps us focused and directed to what we want to achieve. Just look at the disciples. Of, of all people, I think the disciples are really a resilient bunch. Amen? They've gone through, um, most of them are martyred, except for John. So most of them are killed, beheaded, hung on a cross, you know, stoned to death, many, many situations. So the gospel that we have today, actually, a lot of lives have been paid so that today we can hear this gospel. So they paid the price, they are resilient. But if you track back, what's their background? They are known to be uneducated. They are known to be untrained. They are known to be just fishermen, people of the lower class, lower society. But they are able to withstand those great persecution because they remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when they say, when He said to them, you should be salt and light to this world. You should be salt of the earth light to the world do you still remember why you want to serve do you still remember why you are called a christian you are called to make a difference you are commissioned by god to make disciples of all the nations so they clearly have a clear mandate all the disciples that is that was why they can continue on like paul that went through a lot of misery a lot of sufferings in his service in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 14 says this, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance, for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest. You, you see, to Paul, right, it's not easy to get to the palace guard. The best way is that they capture me and send me to jail. Then I can talk to them. He's that positive and all the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear that means Paul is saying essentially hey because right while I was I am still in jail while I'm going through this suffering and I'm still strong it have brought courage to a lot of people so I want to encourage you if you have a sense of mission what you are going through will eventually become an encouragement to someone else don't keep asking why God not fair I, I, I hear my kids would complain to me Papa not fair not fair not fair sometimes we we need to know that unfairness that you're facing now will give you the advantage in your future as well can I have an amen you, you see the successful people they, they have disadvantages but after a while their disadvantages became their strength their edge their advantage if you lose your bearing, you no longer have a sense of mission coming to church, you will dread. If you lose your sense of purpose of being together with your boyfriend or girlfriend or being in a family, you will eventually lose your resilience. Resilience is your ability to bounce back. But this morning, this year, why don't we ask ourselves, why? Why do I continue on? Don't just keep doing ask yourself why if it is human factor then it is time for you to seek the Lord this year I've set a goal for myself to ask more of why's rather than how's and what we need to establish our conviction say conviction come on say conviction we need to establish our conviction we, we, we need to we need to go back to our encounters with the Lord church I don't know I don't know what season you are in but definitely there is a need for you to go back to your burning bush or a new burning bush that means it is where Moses got called there is a need for you to get back to your boat just like Peter to remember why he was called not to be fishermen but to be fishers of men there must be a need for you even this year maybe I rather if if things are not progressive outwardly that much you need a a, a, a whale belly experience like Jonah to be caught inside the belly of a whale to, to, to being turned and tossed but inside the tummy or, or the belly of the whale he heard God clearly that the people in another city in Nineveh needs him more than anything else you need a fort of Jabok like Jacob to be able to wrestle with God 
you know, it is not wrong to, to really engage God in a conversation and say, God, why? Why am I going through this? What is happening? What is the reason? What is the purpose? So establish your sense of mission so that you can be resilient. We cannot survive by our past encounters. If, if I sit down with somebody over lunch, over coffee, over dinner, and they bring up the good old days of their CF days, come on. God works in CF, but God works in your life continuously. Can I have an amen? If you still remember when you were 12 years old, you went for your first camp and the Lord touched you greatly. Fantastic, praise the Lord. But God doesn't just want to touch you when you're 12. God wants to touch you every season of your life. If your last experience, your last encounter was in a crusade, in a big stadium, the presence of God was so strong. Hey, God is a God that moves from strength to strength, faith to faith, glory to glory. Can I have an amen? Dig deep this year. Find your sense of mission. Secondly, very quickly, developing resilience through a healthy community. A healthy community. God in His wisdom has set us from the beginning in the Garden of Eden in a community. Relationships, having friends, or even getting married, essentially, is not to ease your loneliness. It's not to ease your loneliness. It is actually a remedy for your selfishness. Relationship cures our, our need to, to just satisfy ourselves. When you are in a relationship, you begin to put others first. You see, people ask me, when do you think I'm ready for a relationship? Keith, when do you think I'm ready to get attached? When you are ready to give, when you are ready to take care of somebody. Not when you think you really need someone to take care of you. Not when you think, oh, I, 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 will not, I will be less lonely if I have a companion. No, it is for you to compliment, to help, to give to someone else. Can I have an amen? Character is a result of us living in a community. According to the American Psychology Association, there are several key factors in resilience. But the first factor or the most key factor according to this research is healthy relationship. Having a community of people who love and support you helps you to bounce back from disappointment. This, above all, has the greatest impact if we want to stay strong. You look at the initial conversion of the story of Paul he fervently preached the gospel. He was a persecutor. Now he's being persecuted. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be good. You know, I see people chatting away uh, up there. Maybe it is time for you to listen to the word of God. Yep. Please respect the preaching of the word of God. Is that okay? So, so I don't know. I mean, you are playing with phone the whole time and then you are in church for what? Why not we respect the Word of God? It's not about the preacher. Let's have some respect for the Word of God. Can I have an amen? I'm preaching about resilience and, and you are there playing away. It, it, it really gives me a wrong signal of whether I should continue preaching or not. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's pay attention. I don't want to treat any one of you like kids, but I also want you to revere and respect the Word of God. Okay? So, Paul was fervent. Paul, 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 Paul was really excited for what God has called him to do. He, he just came out from an amazing, an amazing encounter with the Lord. And then immediately in, in verse 20, in chapter 9, verse 20, it says, immediately he preached the Christ in synagogues. That, you see, the, the synagogues is where they, they, they uphold Judaism. But he went in and he preached because he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, that Jesus is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroys those who call on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so he might bring them bound to the chief priests? You see, they thought he, he's going to go to this place, Damascus, to persecute them. But why is he preaching about Jesus then? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwell in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Very fast, swing again. This time, Jews were, were going to want to kill who? Their own people. Paul was part of them. Paul was part of them. So, so why, where is that basic relationship that you were once our brother? He wants, they want to kill him. 
But Saul, but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Verse 25 is the key verse. Key verse. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. I, I just gone a little bit more. And then, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. They were all afraid of him, but did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them, now he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. Do you have friends that will put you in a basket and help you escape? I'm not saying putting a basket on top of your head and whack you. I'm saying a friend that will go all the way to find a large basket to let you down the wall so that you will not be killed. You say, uh, this, this context is not relevant. But do you have friends that when you met an accident, when your car is in the workshop, do you have friends that will borrow you or lend you a car? Do you have a friend that, that when your car uh, uh, somehow uh, got problem, broke down by the roadside, do you have a friend that will drive their car to come and pick you up to somewhere else? You see, that basket is like cars in our society today, in our generation today. Or do you have a three o'clock friends? What's the three o'clock friends? That means if something is happening, there's an emergency, there is a friend that you know, even if it is 3 a.m., when you call, they will respond to it. How many of you have a 3 a.m. friends? Praise God. Do you know how you find 3 a.m. friends? Be a 3 a.m. friends. Sometimes we say, oh, all my friends, are, they won't come and help because you are not helpful. If you want to have a 3 a.m. friend, hey, don't call people 3 a.m. just to chit-chat. Is that okay? Eh, hey, I cannot sleep. La. I've got bad dreams. Eh, hey, you chat with me. La. Not, not, not this type. I'm not saying 3 a.m. friends, hey, let's go cyber cafe and uh, yeah, let's not sleep. Tomorrow, let's just zombie in the office and let's just go and play Dota. No, not this kind. Oh. I'm saying when you are in trouble like Paul, you have 3 a.m. friends, friends with a large basket that will let you down to escape. And then he encountered another problem when he went to Jerusalem. The people, hey, Ming Ming Chu Su Ni want to kill us like it's it's you right I, I i you didn't even try a plastic surgery it's you are you are you a spy or what like are you are you are you trying to you know be be a spy and come into our so they are afraid but do you have a friend like Ban barnabas that will vouch for you hey this guy you can trust you, you you can trust this guy i i need friends like that in my life they say oh keith da, 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 da. no 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 not like that we need friends that will vouch for us we need friends that will stand for us. But how do we have such, such friends? You must learn to stand for someone else. You know, when there is a group talking about something else, say, hey, I really think this person is not like that. Maybe we got it wrongly. Let's show some grace. If you are able to sow grace in your relationship, I believe when you're not doing well, you will reap grace. If you always sow judgment, when you are down, people will say, Tai say lah. Ouch. But a healthy community helped Paul to bounce back. Do you see that? People who have strong connections at work are more resistant to stress. Are you eating alone during lunchtime? If you are, turn to your neighbor and say, please repent. I, I in nature, is a task-oriented person. I love to work. But I, I realized there is a need for me to socialize, to walk out from my office and to talk to people more. You know, it is a deliberate effort for some of you. You know, but you say, oh, my colleague always choose the expensive place. Come on, you, you, you find cheap, good place and you suggest. Are you all with me? Turn to your neighbor and say, eat, uh, don't eat alone anymore. Come on. You will be more resilient this year, if you just learn to eat with more people, can I have an amen? Eat together, not eat a lot, okay? 
get, get, get it right. He said, oh, hey, but Keith said, must eat with people, must so you 8 o'clock, one breakfast, 10 o'clock, one breakfast, 12 o'clock, one lunch, 2 o'clock, one lunch, 3 o'clock, then tea time, 5 o'clock, pre-dinner. No, no, no. I, I don't mean like that. I mean you need to build relationship. If you are a leader, please, I want to challenge you to teach people to be friendly this year. Teach your members to learn to develop relationship. I, I realize some people say, hey, that guy is weird. Da, 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 da. Nobody is helping that person. Let's help each other to see their blind spot sometimes. Remember this, we are not building attendance. We are not building buildings. We are not building an organization that runs events. We are building a community of faith. We are building a community through real relationship. Can I have an amen? Quickly, developing resilience through failing forward. This has got to do with your perspective. Failing forward. We need to have the right perspective towards failure. We need to have a right perspective towards struggles or even growth. The fact is this, failure happens. How many of you failed before? Raise your hand. Oh, we are all quite proud, quite real. How many of you failed your moral before? Raise your hand. How many of you failed it more than one time? Raise your hand. I can, I can identify with you. Our spirit are joined together. I always tell people I fail moral because I have moral. Huh? I know that line, man. I use it. How many of you failed Lukisan before painting? You know, the only painting I have done is always poster. Dada Membuno. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if it is still. Oh, come on. Let's give God a big hand. <laughs> I don't know. Is it still the same or we are same generation? The only chance I get to pass is when I draw the three by five or the four by five. And then I try to paint the black ground all black. Boom, one shot. Cannot go wrong, right? Then I start to paint the words. And I always get a C. And I'm happy with a C. I never ever got an A before. We fail. But I'm talking about more serious stuff. Sometimes we make mistakes in life. Maybe I need to validate. Some, how, how many of you fail maths before? Raise your hand. <laughs> a lot more. I realize you're ask A. Hey, ask Moro. Ask Lukisan. Didn't ask maths. I, I passed all my maths. I, I, I passed all my maths. So, 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 hey, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you know what I got for BM in SPM? My trial, right? I got A2, you know. SPM, uh, I got P7. Wow. Jalan. Wait. Kurang aja. Clap for me. But you see, I bounce back. This uh, is a uh, sermon itself. Man, it's a total humiliation because I, I, I really got aggregate 10 in my trial. But wow, when it comes to SPM, jalat, really bad. My dream was to be Andrew Senior um, because he went to UTM. So I really want to get good results to go to UTM. But uh, Andrew got into it. I, I got no choice but to join Inti. You know, have you heard of the... Hey, you all never heard of the poem, I love Inti, but Inti love my money, yes. Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. I love Inti, okay? Please, forgive me. I have my best life, best year, best encounter in Inti. Amazing. You know, I love President Tan. But, uh, so, why am I there? Okay. Failure, I fail. But we must be able to bounce back. What is the reaction about Inti? How many from Inti? Raise your hand. Was from Inti. Not a lot, what? I would think more Taylor student, Taylor's. Yeah. Not a lot also. Anyway. Bouncing back from failures is very important. It is a matter of perspective. You look at Moses. Sometimes we isolate our life. One of the dangerous things in, in, in Christian work is when you isolate your condition, when you isolate your family's condition, when you isolate your, your sicknesses, when you isolate yourself to thinking that only you go through these difficulties, then you are wrong. Because a lot of us go through the same struggle. If you look at the life of Moses, if you look at the life of David, Samson, Jonah, Elijah, you know, Peter, Paul, they all fail terribly, but they bounce back. I believe people that are afraid of failure often don't try. People that don't try usually will not succeed. 
you must overcome your fear. You must learn to enjoy failing forward, struggling up. After exam, right? Walking out from the exam hall. So, how many of you, right? Before you go into exam hall, when there is just one minute, just one minute, you also want to look at your notes. Raise your hand. Too late lah. I am also like that. I'm also like that. Then you go in, you do, 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 two and a half, three hours. When you come out, the first thing you find is to find the answers that you have answered wrongly. Raise your hand. Ayah, I know already. So easy. I should have remembered it. So, right, from lunch to dinner to before sleeping, you only think about, Ayah, why I didn't answer correctly. You see, the negative things in life has a way to possess us. We never count the answers we answer correctly. And if we don't build on what we have done correctly, we will never be successful in life. If you constantly think, allow those negative things to, to, to possess you, it is very hard for you to go forward. It is the same in life. My friends, we always let those people that have left us to occupy 90% of our lives and left with a 10% for those that have stuck by us. We really need to learn to understand, to put our effort to those that have stick by us all these years rather than just those who have left us. Can I have an amen? Learn to appreciate your wife and your children more. Learn to appreciate your poor cell leader. You know, learn. Not poor as in no money, okay? Come on. We have some rich cell leaders here. I don't want to say names. But, and I don't want you to guess also. But, learn, learn to appreciate those around you rather than those who have left you. How many of you agree with me? People that has left you, people that has done bad about you, occupy at least 70, 80, 90% of your life, yes? You're constantly thinking about them. Why, why, why? Let's learn not to shortchange those that are around us. Have a perspective about failure. We fail, but we also learn. We fail, but we also gain. We, we fail, but we also have new experiences. When we fail, we can either erect a tombstone or we can actually change it to a stepping stone. Let our failure be a stepping stone. Amen? I guess you're alright. I want to tell you I'm, uh, uh, we're still early. It's only 11.30 and I'm coming to my last point soon. I thank Christ our Lord who has given me strength in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 16. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was one a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I, have, I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul knows he has failed. But for that very reason, I have shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience, patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul's failure, Paul's testimony impacted the whole Gentile world because from a persecutor, he became a builder. If you have failed, your testimony is going to be great because people will see how you succeed. How you, how you succeed. Peter is a good example of failure. He failed. He denied Christ terribly. But it was on the day of Pentecost that he preached that got 3,000 saved. He bounced back from his failure. We all need to learn to fail forward. Turn to your neighbor and say, fail forward. People who are resilient have the ability to pick themselves up and carry on. They don't see themselves as victims. They see themselves as survivors. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a survivor. Those with resilience are able to find positive meaning to their difficult situations. And I, for myself, I realize that I want to learn to embrace challenges and difficult situations more and more if I want to be successful. If you see problem as something that will destroy you, 
then you need to change your perspective. Problems are there to be solved so that your value can increase. Can I have an amen? The more difficult the problem and you are able to solve, the more your value will increase in life, in your company, in your family. It is a perspective. And finally with this, I will end developing resilience through having faith in a loving God. C.S. Lewis said this, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with Him. He walks everywhere incognito, in disguise. And in incognito, it's not always easy to penetrate. The real labor is to remember to attend. Church, I want to tell you this this morning. The real labor is in remembering to attend, to be here. In fact, to come awake. Still more, to remain awake. Do you think the presence of God will ever leave you? No. Do you think He will leave you or forsake you? No. He will be with you till the end of age. But your labor is in pressing in to be resilient. Whatever situation you are in right now, let Jesus be your security. To Paul, when it comes to things that are beyond his control, when things like he, he has thorns in the flesh that he couldn't understand why God just don't remove it, doesn't remove it. Well, when everything is tough, he said in Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So when he doesn't understand the mystery of God, he, 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 he be spirit-led. He, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God and we know that all things work for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose finally that in verse 37 no are you all still with me no in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced. Guys, establish your conviction. Establish your conviction. It is, it is my duty to remind Kira to do her homework. But it is my greatest joy as a father to see her finally understand why she has to do her homework. Why she has to go to school. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any else anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's give God a big hand. Come on. He will not forsake you. Come on, somebody give God praise. Have faith in a loving God. Not have faith in an institution or a structure or a system or a formula or a person. Yes, a person. The person is Jesus. Have faith in a loving God. The misfortune that you're experiencing in this season will not be that bad after all if you persist on. Everything that you are going through right now, as long as you do not give up this year, I believe you will see the purpose of it. Whether it be Moses, Joseph, Daniel, Peter, Paul, Elijah, all of them thought about giving up. All of them argue with God many times. But the thing is, like Paul said, he got up and he got back into the city. I have a story that I want to tell you. You know, this man by the name of Dooley. Dooley was born in 1971 in Wimbledon, London. At the age of 18, Dooley, Dooley got a sports scholarship in the States. Immediately, he went over. But there in the state, he met a car accident that damaged his knees. That really crushed him because he could no longer pursue a sports career. He returned to UK and was hospitalized. He became an angry man, depressed and felt lost. And at those lowest moments, his dearest godfather passed away. He couldn't make it to see him. But his godmother passed him. And Olympus OMD 
10 camera and a war photography book by Don McMillan. McCullen. You know, it's, I, I, I so happen to have a staff that have exactly the same camera. And Olympus, OMD, not OMG, okay, OMD 10. And a war photography book. This was what was left for Dooley. So what happened after that? From there, he picked up photography and became a music photographer. He became a well-known photographer in Hollywood and began to take pictures of celebrities from Marilyn Manson, uh, Manson, Mariah Carey, Lenny Kravitz, and many, many more. He took a lot of pictures. His career in Hollywood as a photographer extended for 10 years, from 19 to 29. However, after being in the industry for 10 years, he became depressed and unhappy again. In one of his photo shoots in London, he threw his camera out of the windows because he was just too tired of them arguing and, 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 and complaining. These divas, he felt, he felt like, why am I taking pictures of people that just want to look good in front of others, but at the back scene, they have very bad attitude and character. This is not what he was called to do, to capture pictures that will tell stories. And he is feeling it because though he is he's successful, though he is rich, but he is not fulfilled inside him. Then he remembered the gift that his godfather gave to him. Realized all along he hasn't followed his destiny. So he sold his apartment, gave up his job, and pursued a career as a full-time documentary photographer covering conflicts around the world. While he was in mission in 2011 in Afghanistan, he stepped on a landmine and lost both his legs and his left arm. He underwent 37 surgeries, 37 operations, and took him a full three years before he is well enough to return to work. In 2014, he even went to Lebanon, it's an extremely dangerous place, to document the, the life of the Syrian refugee. One of the photos taken by him inspired a young man called Mark in Australia. While Mark was pursuing his medical degree, he saw the photo that Giles Dooley took and reminded him to persist on of his dream because he wanted to be a mission doctor. Mark wanted to pursue medicine because he has a greater purpose on being a doctor. Because of that one photo, Mark got into Brisbane Medical School to study and he graduated as the top 1% of his class as a surgeon. One photo impacted a young man's life. Giles Dooley said this, 25 years after that camera was given to me, the ripples of the action was still being felt in affecting people around me. That wouldn't happen if Giles Dooley was not resilient. You want to shine for God. You want to really make an impact. You've got to be resilient. You've got to, you've got to make your faith count and don't play a fool. I can go on and on, guys, with stories after stories after stories of the Bible, of real life. That life is not about being struck down, but truly, my friends, life is about getting up. Can I have an amen? You know, life truly as a church, maybe we have suffered maybe have gone through some rough patches. It is not about how low we have been hanging on, it is about how strong we can come back up City Harvest. That this is a resilient church because we have the gospel to preach for our Lord Jesus Christ. That we are not here to organize the event and just to make you have goosebumps and feel good that this is a cool church. We have a message inside of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have a message. We are bent, but we are not broken. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are bent, but you're not broken. If you are sitting beside a bend and say, your name is your destiny, come on. Let me read to you the first part I started. 
Acts 14, verse 19 to verse 20. I hope you appreciate this verse more now. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Must be, must be really tough, right, to think that he was dead. Must be really terrible. But after the disciples had gathered, after the community has gathered around him, he got up. He got up and went back into the city. This morning, how many of you are thankful that Paul got up? Half the New Testament will be gone if that day he hadn't get up. When you get up, someone will be thankful. Trust me. You might think not worth it, but every time I got up, every time when I thought about quitting, you, you think that I've never thought about it. I thought about quitting. I thought about giving up. I thought about living another life. But I know every time I got up, someone else will be blessed. Today, we are thankful for the Apostle Paul for his labor. But I want to let you see the full price that he has paid. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30. You guys all right? Let's look at the screen. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from reefers, in danger from bandits, in danger from the fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in, in, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. I've been in cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness for when I'm weak I know he is strong let's give God a big hand amen come on I I don't want you to subscribe to a wrong Christian faith the origin of our faith comes through a man that has suffered much to give you hope the origin of a church from beginning came from much persecution they paid a great price for us to know the saving grace of God today I want to challenge you I know it's Chinese New Year I want to challenge you to be resilient not for this year for your whole life let's not be soft and let's not be easily emotional, easily want to give up, easily sensitive, easily fall sick. Let's be stronger this year. Let's be stronger this year. There is a world outside waiting for us to bring them to the grace of God. Let's not worry over petty issues. Let's not fight over petty stuff. If today, this morning, someone took your favorite seat, I want to tell you, God is in your new seat. If someone has said something, maybe that is not so nice about, hey, your hair, not so nice. Let's not give up our faith because of our hair. Is that okay? Let's not give up so easily. Be resilient. Turn to your neighbor and say, be resilient. Can I have all of you stand up on your feet before we go? Let us all pray. Let us all pray.